It's my real privilege to introduce to you three incredibly talented uh, friends, but more importantly, incredibly talented music creators uh, from across the spectrum here. We have Sarah Sleen. She's a four-time Juno nominee, Canadian Screen Award winner, a uh, modern-day renaissance woman, according to her website. She uh, <laughs> serves on the board of directors of SOCAN. She's an incredible singer-songwriter who bridges the pop and classical worlds, and uh, she's a fantastic screen composer in her own right. Um, Kevin Lau is, uh, has been composer in residence or affiliated composer with organizations like the Banff Center, uh, the Toronto, Mississauga, Niagara, and Manitoba Chamber Orchestras. Uh, he's an awesome classically trained composer whose scope ranges from ballet to children's concerts to film scores, and you can find his music on two Juno award-winning records. Finally, we have Emritha Vaz. She is a two-time Annie nominee and an ASCAP Composer's Choice Award for a Best TV Score for her work on Disney's Mira Royal Detective. She's an alumna of the Sundance Composers Lab, and she's a founding member of the Composers Diversity Collective. So welcome all of you guys, and I'd like to maybe go around the table and ask you, what was your aha moment when you discovered that you wanted to be a music creator and be, when you thought you could actually make it into a career? So maybe Sarah, we'll start with you. Oh, um, well, apologies to Oprah. It was not an aha for me. Um, it was more of a, you know, I, I had parents who were very interested in enriching my life as a child, so I tried lots of things. And the only thing that I was really interested in was music. But I, I think it's, it's so, there are so many diverse ways into music. And I had a very strange ride. I started classically, like a lot of people do, in piano. Was really um, totally in love with the piano. Loved playing, loved listening to the radio and playing songs from the radio on the piano. Really just very focused um, in love with music. That took me to university for classical. And then two years later, I was signed to a record deal for the songs that I was creating. It really just happened so quickly. And I was so young. And I just was kind of saying yes to the things that were just naturally occurring in my world. I think intellectually and creatively, I really thrive on new newness, new environments, new collaborators and new sounds, learning new skills. I, I just, that's the thing that I really gravitate to. I can't really stay put for too long. Thanks, Sarah. And Maritha, how about your, what's your story? Um, I think, um, you know, like Sarah, I didn't have a specific aha moment, but I can think back to what really made me start considering composing. Um, the aha moment was I was doing a completely, I had tendonitis in my arms, so when I started off being a musician, I sort of ended that short at 16 and then I went off and did some other degrees. Uh, and so I was in this other profession altogether and uh, hit a wall getting work uh, as a lawyer. I came back from doing post-conflict work and an old friend reminded me of my connection to music and invited me to write music for uh, his short film. And that feeling that I used to get when I was playing live music, that thrill, that something, you know, reverberating inside me that was bigger than me that suddenly happened again while writing music for film and it was really exciting it was like i was being reminded of a, a favorite flavor of ice cream you know when you're little and you're like oh my god i love this and so it it really ignited me in that exciting that passion but then the idea of making it into a career i mean if anyone had talked to me back then as a composer they'd be like you have zero skills you have no connections um, you know nothing and you're farther along age-wise than you might, you know, be to start this kind of career. Why would you do this now? So I'm lucky that myself at my age didn't talk to myself at that age because I probably would have convinced myself not to do it. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, d I foolishly and life just threw opportunities my way that I said yes to and I went down this path. Um, and because of that sort of like awakening, um, you know, I, I, I went there. Thanks, Amrith. That's great. Kevin, your turn. Yeah, I'm I'm very much of the same. First of all, I want to say that I'm kind of nerding out over here because, you know, both of you are so deeply involved. Actually, all, all of you are so deeply involved with film and uh, film music has been very close to my heart for a very long time. Um, but yeah, when I, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I never imagined that I would uh, enter music as a career, uh, much less composing, much less composing concert music. Uh, it was 
it's not to say that it was the farthest thing from my mind, but it was like not a thing that I imagined was actually existed. Like I didn't realize that it was something I could do. Um, totally. And in my high school years, I was just very diligently uh, preparing for a career in something sciencey or something mathy. Didn't know what it was, but that was just kind of the implicit expectation, I suppose. But my my first love was actually creative writing. Um, Sarah knows this. I, I love creative writing as yeah. uh, as a high school student, and I remember writing like a three hundred page thing. I won't call it a novel because that's kind of a disservice to novels. But I, I wrote this <laughs> really really long thing in high school, and. For some reason, I was I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this got turned into a movie? And then I got to actually write the music for it. And Ooh. that was actually my first foray into composing, uh, where I just decided, oh, you know what? I'm just going to fantasize about this and try it and give it a go. I was studying piano at the time, but I had no formal training in composition. And the moment I started to actually write music uh, in this very, very, you know, dinky MIDI software that sounds, you know, totally horrible, um, I just completely fell in love with uh, w with the process. And I felt like I could sink hours and hours and hours of, of time into doing this and have that time just kind of vanish. And so that's the moment when I knew that I, I love doing it. Um, but as Emrita says, in terms of career, like, there's a difference between wanting to do something and then knowing that it's going to actually work as a, as a career. Um, and yeah. to this day, I would say that that question still keeps popping up. There are, there are years that are better than other years. So this mm -hmm. is a year where I've been very busy. So I, I'm sort of like, oh yeah, this works. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm writing music for a career. It's very cool. I get to wake up in the morning and be grateful for that. And then there are other years where I'm like, should I just switch? <laughs> Should I just do <laughs> yeah. something else? You know, do you so know how it's... refreshing this is to hear both of you say that? Like, <laughs> thank you. It's so nice to hear. <laughs> oh, all the time. All the time. I, I mean, let me, uh, let, let, let's riff on that a little bit here, because I, I think that imposter syndrome is something that, you know, we obviously all deal with. And, and I'm just kind of, I'll throw this out to all of you. How do you deal with an imposter syndrome? Um, I, I really struggle with imposter syndrome. Uh, and I, I think that it's funny, you, you know, part of that is important for our job because I think that sort of that heightened awareness of what the bar could be, uh, plus also the willingness totally. to look at yourself and never take it sort of for granted. Like that sort of, um, because you're always getting notes. Like if you were in the position where you're like, I got this, I, I know exactly what I'm doing all the time. I never, I never need to improve, which none of us could possibly have, then we'd never be able to work with other people. Um, but the thing with film score specifically too, is that it's so subjective. Nobody mm -hmm. expects, I don't think for you to quote unquote, get exactly what the director or the storyteller was thinking right away. And that storyteller or director may not have an exact idea of what the music should be. So we're, we're really just all taking risks all the time. And so that willingness to take risks and know inherently that you don't know what the answer is, but have enough of a trust of yourself to say, I'm just going to try something despite that is sort of this, you know, constant battle. But I, I think I should probably, it would probably be healthier for me to have less of an imposter syndrome. <laughs> just, just, you know what I mean? It would probably just be healthier for everybody around me. Cause I know for the first three weeks that I'm working on anything, I'm just a terror to be around because I just, I hate everything. I hate everything I've done. It all Same. sounds like crap, uh, you know, and it's just like, how could I possibly be in this field? They're going to find out that I don't belong here. And I'm just, I'm going to fail upwards. And I'm, if I'm lucky, uh, so, you know, that <laughs> mindset is the worst person to be around for those first three weeks. And then I kind of hit this moment where I'm like, oh, I think something's working. Oh my God, it's totally working. Oh my God. Okay. Now I'm getting excited, you know, and then that, that, you know, and it's sort of kind of the eye rolling of my poor partner who like kind of just watches me, but know very well, he has to do the same thing with his own process. But I feel like it's just part and parcel of maybe being an artist and also being a person of color and also being a woman and also those things that you constantly are told, like they're not worthy to be at the table because you don't see many mm -hmm. other people like you around the table. And so you're just, and your family was never like, yeah, that table's not something you want to be at anyway. <laughs> you should have been, Oof. you know, a doctor, lawyer, whatever, whatever. Um, oh, yes. yeah, it's- You it's, are speaking my language, girlfriend. 
Felt all I wanna, that. I, I want to go on that a little bit. I, I want to go. I, I want to riff a little bit on that, uh, Amritha, and and, uh, and and for all of you, because that um, the whole notion of sort of family support, right? Um, you know, I, I Kevin and I probably, you know, our, our parents probably play mahjong together, or something <laughs> like that, right? Where they, where they, where they, where they complain, oh, I, yeah, did he hear about this? Kid? You know, they th- they first talk about all of their kids who are making like you know three hundred thousand dollars selling insurance or something like that, yes. and they go, yes. oh yes, and my child, he's a, he's, yeah, he's a composer, you know, he's speaking my language. But I, I wanted to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go, and 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 I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because. From from a lot of um, uh, um, from a lot of communities um, where sort of you know taking that creative risk, taking that that life risk is something that's not necessarily encouraged, you know. And so I want to maybe put that to, to all of you and see how you know and see what your thoughts were in terms of family support, especially going into that sort of creative field. Yeah, I mean. It's it's hard because as I get older, I think I'm more and more sympathetic to the concerns that my parents uh, had as I was going into, and and I'm also grateful too because um, you know there's a stereotype, of course, of the of the immigrant parent who doesn't allow their children to to do anything artistic, and and my parents were not like that. Uh, they were the moment I said that I was really interested in pursuing composition as a as a major, um, they were they were behind me now. They were they supported me. I think that they had reservations, and I think that they expressed, you know, sentences that were cautious and um, and and <laughs> um, cautious. Lucky you got that cautious. Is- Lucky you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's but it, it's funny because like I think in the earlier stages of my career, they were actually very very supportive, and they were they understood the idea of your your child pursuing something that they love being uh, mm-hmm. uh, of importance at least to me and they understood that as a value um, and so I, I really appreciated that um, I think later on actually it got a little we had a few there was a little bit of tension uh, because of the instability of the career I think it's mm-hmm. something that they didn't quite understand and and to be fair maybe I didn't really grasp either was just how hard it is to have anything resembling a stable foothold um you know we're we're so used to seeing the people around us have these salaries that are kind of like fixed from year to year or maybe they kind of crawl up upwardly and to to have like a child where you know one year nothing happens you know um it's really i think that can be really hard on them and they can express it in ways that are um, sometimes not that helpful. So we've had a, a few a few discussions over the years. I think things are good now, but definitely about five years ago or so, like we definitely entered into a, a rough space there. Hmm. I don't know if any of you have had uh, experiences that are like that or. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, it's all very it's all, <laughs> it, it's it's always it's all very relatable. Um, I know I'm. Not sure if you wanted to jump in first, Sarah, but it sounds like, mm-hmm. you know, for me, obviously, our parents were supportive enough, clearly, for us to be here. We can't just magically do this sort of level of writing without music lessons, without, um, you know, somebody deciding to pay for those because they're very expensive now as a parent, mm-hmm. you know, seeing that um, mm-hmm. and making that choice to support, you know, you going down that path. So obviously, it's very lucky my parents supported me with violin and piano lessons and composition lessons and took me drove me all over the place for little Kiwanis music festivals and <laughs> you know all these adorable things that take energy and commitment and so they've invested money and time so in some ways they ended up being invested in it too but their desire for me to have some stability always kind of overrode that and I think there was a desire for them to say can't it just be a hobby you know yeah. and, and that, I got that a lot I got that a lot and um, yeah. the, but the but the truth is they still wanted me it I, I think is the, the thing is so long as you are the best at whatever you do right because there's no right we're always we still have to be the best it's like you can't just do the thing that makes you happy um you know they didn't leave india for me to be a musician you know what i mean like <laughs> they didn't like slave uh, in jobs that they they had degrees above doing so that their child would go off and be some unemployed uh you know 
happy <laughs> musician. You know, it just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to them. But also they know that like happiness can only take you so far. And, and that's it. And, and, and again, as a parent, I completely relate to that. Yeah. It is tough when you're struggling financially um, and, uh, and no amount of, of bliss uh, in what you do will, will, will necessarily pay those bills. Right. So I get all that. And, um, uh, but, but, but I think there was a point, there was a turning point for them when they started to, I think, especially like our, you know, I, I say this is an Asian American, uh, uh, you know, or Asian Canadian, um, you know, my parents, once they saw like my name in the credits, they were like, Oh, Ooh. okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Just wait. I have to make a phone call. Um, you know, there's this kind of like, okay, there's some cachet. You know, there's some like something at least that you're, you know, you can bring to the table. <laughs> For sure. For yep. sure. Yeah. I saw this thing on Instagram not long ago. It's a picture of Stevie Nicks, you know, early days, Fleetwood Mac. She's like got her wild hair and she's sitting there. And the quote was something like her, you know, my dad said to me, what are you doing? You're broke all the time. You have two crappy jobs. You're going to these horrible rehearsal spaces with these crazy people. What are you doing? And she says, it's what I came here to do. And at a certain point, I think I've just accepted that fish got to swim and birds got to fly. You are yeah. the creature that you are. And totally. whether society rewards what you are True. or not, or picks you up and then tosses you aside or any version thereof is really beside the point, you know? And True. I'm a parent now and I, I have a whole new perspective on, on my hopes and dreams for her, but you know, like you can't hope for an easy life free yes. from friction because that's not life. <laughs> That's yep. just not life. Yep. I don't. I don't wish you know unusual amounts of friction for my child, <laughs> but I you know yes, you could go work for the insurance industry and make three hundred grand, but then you would have no idea if you were born an artist or you have that seed inside. You would have no idea what's in you. You would you would never mm -hmm. discover your yourself and your potential. Mm -hmm. And I think my parents, they've always been very supportive of whatever I wanted to do. They were always at the shows. They were always cheering. They were always like, we're so proud, you know, but they also found it difficult to see their their daughter extremely unhappy or extremely feeling very insecure about the future and all those things. Right. So I think it's a delicate balance. And I, I mean, now that I'm a mom, I think, God, that's a, that's a tough balance to strike. You know, like I want, I want you to be happy, but I also want you to do what you feel you're meant to do. And, you know, it's a tricky balance. I think, and I think, you know, just from my personal experience, um, I think the definition of success varies between generation to generation, right? You know, I, I think, my, you know, my parents see success as 2.3 kids and, you know, a house in suburban Edmonton, the minivan, you know, and, and, and just, to, just, to add, just to add a little bit of humor into this, right? Um, you know, when we premiered Human Odyssey in concert, you know, we had, we were at the Windspear Center in Edmonton, full house, sold out, you know, standing ovation, you know, and we're backstage toasting champagne, and he's there with my composing teacher, my old composing teacher, John Astasio, right? And so, you know, my mother goes to John, so John, you're the expert here, was that any good? <laughs> <laughs> you know? and it's just like, you know, <laughs> I love my mother, but but all that, oh, but, I, but I do think that, you know, oh, 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 that, that generation gap, you know, and, and, and I think that's even, that's highlighted more, um, within, you know, uh, first generation Canadians, I think, um, in terms of just like, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. And, we, but, it, but it's really comforting to hear that we all have sort of, sort of those, you know, when we talk about imposter syndrome, you know, it's not just, it, you know, it's not just me. And I think that's really comforting. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about your biggest fuck up. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you fuck up something? And you thought that like, holy shit, my career is over. And how did you recover from it? Um, I think in our industry, we really have to say yes to things before we're ready, because you actually don't know whether you know how to write, in mm -hmm. my case, music for animation. So sometimes you do have to say, like, especially if you're an up and coming person, and even at any level, you kind of have to say yes and be very confident and, and instill that confidence. Uh, the taking on too many things. 
I've also done that and it's made me better ma managing, you know, a better time manager. Um, and it's also helped me realize that, oh, wow, I can do more. So sometimes it's that throwing yourself into the deep end. It is, I can see how like anyone could overstep that because you, you're always pushing yourself. You're trying to figure out what, where the edges are mm -hmm. and that people pleaser, te you know, Te, you know, tendency, which is we, we also have to have in our industry to be kind of good at what we do, because it's always our fault. It's always like, you know, that the, there's never too little time to do what it is you want to ask, you know, ask me to do, you know, so we always kind of have to be able to say yes. And it's, it falls on us still when, when, you know, we've taken on too much, but it's kind of just part of that game of like balancing those things out. I think my biggest fuck up, it's, 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 it's a little bit darker in that it took a toll in my personal life. Um, mm. you know, saying yes to things, always prioritizing your career, because that's kind of what you feel like you need to do in order to get those opportunities, especially when they come to you and you're just so grateful that someone's you know, including you in the mix and you just say yes to things. You start having no, not only no time for yourself, but no time for your family. Um, and in my case, I lost a partner in the process. Oh. And it was a it was it was an important reminder. And look, I'm a happy person now. I'm remarried. You know, everything. I have a, a child. You know, the life works out in its own way. But I will tell you, this time around is completely different mm. because I'm aware that no matter how important I might place on, you know, how much importance I might place on my career, this is just a job. Mm -hmm. It is just a TV show. TV shows are made every day. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it is good enough. You got to just stop. Because what matters is the people around you and, and, you know, so this, we're going to look back, you know, the whole thing about looking back on your life and like, who are the important people? What is the important thing we're doing? Um, so I think that always has to be like, now I'm better at sort of knowing, okay, I'm going to lose this time with my daughter. Is it worth it? And so I found myself, this is one of the other questions I know was, uh, you know, kind of up in the air is that like, at what point, like, do you, you know, is in terms of your personal life, like weighing those things of like, what point do you say no to things? And and I think I say no a lot more often than I ever would have before, partly because I'm getting older. <laughs> I feel like I can't, I have like this show, I took like five, you know, all nighters in a row and it, it happened a lot, but I could, you know, I really want to have that time for family. So I kind of learned the hard way that people will start moving out of your world, whether it's good friends or family, um, if you keep prioritizing your career over everything else. Amen. Yeah. Very well done. That's a great segue into a, one of the questions, which was maintaining life work balance. Sarah, you know, you're a new mom, you know, uh, and you, you have an incredibly punishing schedule with traveling, gigging, uh, composing everything. So how do you, how do you, how do you balance it's, that? What we've been discussing here, um, those words just landed on me, by the way, Amritha, all of that big time. You have to say no. I have to say no way more than I ever did. In fact, it was my joy when I was much younger to say yes to almost everything to the point where I was like, did I really just say yes to singing this like soprano part for an opera singer when I'm not an opera singer? You know, like I would just do things that were so wildly out of my comfort zone because that would give me lots of adrenaline and juice. But now I'm like, I've got these zones that I like, I feel good. I can go to the outer edge, but I'm not gonna go out of the stratosphere anymore like, like I used to. So yeah, because I, I, when they're little, they're growing so fast, you don't wanna miss any of it. So I think just saying no and knowing which, you have to know, you have to be very calibrated to the way your body responds when an offer even comes in. Like I think your body tells you which is the one that's gonna give me joy, which is the one that I am gonna make, like I'm gonna knock out of the park. And what's the one that's like, this is not really my wheelhouse and it's gonna be a struggle every step of the way. That, you know, slight calibration has helped me. It still hurts saying no, because we're so programmed to wanna to take it all, right? But because you never know when more will come. It's just the way that we have to exist. But saying no and, and being calibrated towards the stuff that you could really shine for. Absolutely. Kevin, I don't know. I, I know you don't have uh, you don't have kids, but still, work life balance is still a real thing for anybody. So yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's one of the most 
one of the things that I'm actually most passionate about is trying to find a daily routine that I can go home at the end of the day and say that was that was a good day, you know. Um, and some very often that doesn't involve, um, you know, working blitzing through the entire day, which means um, that if I am if I've invited a kind of career that forces me to do that at the expense of every other thing, you know, both of you have talked about this already, but at the expense of my partner, um, my dog, <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my social life, all of that stuff, um, mm -hmm. then, yeah, then, then there's something that's kind of, um, then the balance has sort of shifted. Um, sometimes I like to think of it as, as short-term versus long-term um, commitment as well because I think in the short term all of us have the capacity to go really really hard and to go beyond our natural you know what we think of as our natural capacity you know if Steven Spielberg calls any of us I'm sure we would all say yes to whatever yes you know um, so I think we have that built us into us but there's a sort of long-term um, uh, burnout that can happen if you're constantly going and going and going and so um, sometimes there are sort of paradoxical things that I do that um, you know, like taking time out of, like taking an entire day of the week where I don't do any work at all. Um, my wife and I actually do what, what we call a screen-free Saturday where we go off of our phones and our laptops and our screens uh, for the entire day. Um, and it's, it's because I discovered that reading was something that I just really, really miss doing. And I love to read and I, and I was not reading for like the last four years. And so um, particularly in the last year or so, like we've kind of got back into that. And um, it has the side benefit of actually improving my productivity. That's not the reason why I'm doing it. But I actually find that when I take more time off, I'm a lot more energized to begin with. To do. Uh, yes. And then, yeah. So so I try That's to so actually give myself as much leisure time as I as I can, um, in order to make everything else uh, as pristine as possible. Mm -hmm. Amazing. All right. I'm going to ask the last question, and I'm going to try to do two part. Two, two parts of the question is, how do you make sure you have gigs coming in through the door? And then if you can think of one little tidbit advice to an emerging music creator looking to make into this career, what would that be? So, Sarah, I'm going to start with you. Uh, gigs coming through the door. Well, I would say, like, to not, to understand the difference between being discouraged and being uncomfortable and out of your comfort zone, right? Like, mm. because being sort of out mm. of your comfort zone and uncomfortable is good. You're, you're growing. You're, you're, you kind of don't know what you're doing. You're, you're getting your footing, you're learning, you're expanding, but the discouragement and that, you know, maybe being avoidant with, with work and discipline, that's a, that's a different feeling. And that's a feeling that you need to conquer, right? If you're going to, if you're going to do this, this feeling, you got to get used to it. You, you got to learn how to like it. This feeling, no one to recognize it and either conquer it or, um, you know, find some way to change it into that feeling. Thank you. Kevin, I'm going to go to you. I would say, like, like, I think my advice is to protect the part of you that is motivated as much as possible. Because it's very mm -hmm. hard to be motivated when you have deadlines and huge volumes of music to crank out. And as much as possible, finding the hobby in the in the profession, and and protecting that space, uh, because once that starts to go, and and you know there are situations where you can't have that all the time, but once that starts to go on mass, um, that's when it actually gets very hard to work, and when it mm. gets very hard to work, then you're very you're getting close into burnout territory. So protecting the things that make you joyful when you're writing. That is such good advice. Amazing. I that's, feel that's like I should be game. paying to be part of this conversation. <laughs> Feels like I, therapy. Sarah, I just took notes on. <laughs> you'll get the invoice. You'll, you'll, you'll get the, the invoice. Of the mail, Sarah. And Bertha, I'm going to I'm oh, give the final okay, word. Okay, so on this. Sarah so. and Kevin, it's been such an honor, and you too, Darren. Um, oh, likewise. These last few, you know, uh, advice, piece of advice, I'm taking for myself. So clearly, it's not young music creators it's all music creators uh that can you know be reminded of this journey because it's just it's just a hard one and, and i i think that that kevin also brought up a good uh thing too that for me as a creative is reminding myself that i'm not just i'm not just fed by music i'm fed by reading i'm fed by visual art like going to the you know art going to an art gallery with my daughter uh, was just so wonderful to be like kind of just reminded of the things that the connections the things that colors all of that that makes me 
passionate about the sounds that I want to make. And, and um, uh, so I think just finding that joy, like you talk about, you know, I think the business part of being a film user, film <laughs> composer can just be so daunting and gross and like mm -hmm. hard. And like, for me, it was anxiety inducing just to even come on this show. You know, I love Darren and I, I imagined I would love you too as well, being friends of Darren. And yet I was still like, oh God, what am I going to talk about? Because the part of the job is what can be kind of hard and, and feel like a bit of a show sometimes. But when I just boil it down to why am I here, what I'm excited about, then I'm, I find I'm instantly interested in writing music or I'm instantly interested in like pursuing something. So that finding, bringing that back into my craft, especially when I was working on a 22 minute, you know, 22 minutes of music every two weeks, uh, 24 episodes, a 25 episode show for the last three or four years, it's been, it's been that, it's been just meeting deadlines and doing that hard work every day. Um, so, so finding that joy again is, is something I'm looking forward to as well. Beautiful. I can't tell you, uh, all of you, how much I enjoyed this. This was, this was so much fun, um, and I wish we had a little bit more time. But, uh, but Kevin and Maritha, Sarah, thank you so much for being so candid, so being so generous with your time. And we often minimize sort of the impact that these sort of conversations have on other people, but I think that it'll, it'll go a real long way, I think, for just keeping people motivated and keeping people just engaged into, uh, into you know, taking that next step for the career to so, that end can i take a obliged. picture of Thank us because so i'm gonna do that annoying promo thing that saps us of our energy <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. okay everybody Smile! absolutely for more candid conversations and free music creator resources visit musiccreator.ca the screen composers guild of canada acknowledges the support of the canada council for the arts thanks for listening